Hello, I'm Aziz Hanifa, the executive editor of India Abroad, and welcome to another episode of The Trailblazers, an interview series showcasing stories of Indian American immigrants from different fields. Our guest today is Dr. Navin Shah, the founder of the American Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, better known as ARPI, and arguably the largest and most influential international medical association in the US. Navin, who is a Maryland urologist, has been for the past few decades a long-time activist both on behalf of the Indian Americans and international physicians practicing in the US. Welcome, Navin. It's a pleasure to thank see you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If you can talk about that initial American journey of yours, uh, from being born and raised in Pune, and then being a general uh, physician in Pune, and a general surgeon in Pune. Well, initially, I wanted to go and do a FRCS in London. But we were very poor. I had no money. In the meantime, a friend of mine said, let us go to Mumbai and appear in UCMLE. That, that time it was known as ECFMG. Which is the uh, examination you've got to do if you want to come to the US as a foreign medical graduate. Correct. Even though I had no desire just to give him a company, I went along. Unfortunately, he failed and I passed. And so all of a sudden a door was opened for me without money because I knew that if they give me a job, they will send me a ticket also, which happened. So it was a miracle for me that I got a job and I got a free ticket. And that time another thing that happened, I wrote a paper, I was assistant, uh, assistant honorary surgeon at BJ Medical College, Sasson Hospital in Pune. So I wrote an article about prostate hernia with one incision and I thought it will be a great uh, article for Indian Journal of Surgery. To my bad luck, they rejected my paper. And now I'm appointed, given a job and a ticket to go to America. So I said, let me send it to Archives of Surgery. Which is a US publication. US publication. Yeah. And it's a prestigious yeah. uh, journal surgery yeah. uh, magazine, yeah. I mean the journal. Yeah. And to my good luck, they not only they accepted the paper as a lead article, but Professor Nias wrote a big article, editorial on my article. And that's how I came to America, even though I had not planned it. And in those early years, you were married to Leela, and you were then hopefully going to get uh, Leela and uh, your children over to the US. And unlike a lot of other uh, Indian American and South Asian uh, physicians who came to the US, who did an internship, who did a residency. You didn't do an internship, but began uh, practicing as a general surgeon. Can you speak to that? And to those early years, uh, how difficult it was and how you made it a point uh, to hang on and make sure that ultimately Leela and the children would also come and join you. Initially, my plan was to go back to India after five years of surgery or specialty. And initially it was very tough. It was, now they talk of 80 hours, but we, we did much more than 80 hours because I wanted to excel. I want to prove myself. And I was very sincere because this was make or break for me. And um, first for a few months I cried every night because I used to miss my two daughters, my wife. And this is the first time I left Pune. I've never gone out of India, this is the first time. And, but gradually it sunk into me that I should not leave this place because they were like 10 years advanced in surgery and medical practice. And so I thought of staying and immediately I wrote to Leela, which like a good Indian wife and a good friend, and she agreed. And so I decided to stay here. And then I believe uh, you got a job at the Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C., because initially you had come to Akron, Ohio, where you were doing general surgery. And then it was after you came to Washington, D.C. and had been practicing in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, uh, that I believe that you found that there were 
quite a few Indian American organizations and you felt that it would be good to have sort of an umbrella organization. And initially when RP was formed, that it was to give something back to the motherland in terms of continuing medical education, CME, and probably try to do some equipment donation. Was that the genesis of RP? Well, uh, let me take you back uh, to my internship. Now, by this time, when I was ap applying and when I got a job, they already knew that my paper is going to be published. And that's how they said, OK, you're a general surgeon, you're trained completely, and your paper is published in Archives of Surgery and also editorial is written, so you won't do internship, and that was good for me. Now, coming to Washington, D.C., Dr. Debney Jarman was president of American Board of Urology, and he took me under his wings, and I got a job. Now, that time, what I thought, because I was already assistant surgeon in Pune, BJ Medical College, for four years, and I thought the CME is the most important thing because in India, once you're a doctor, lifelong you're a doctor. So the CME struck me and I thought, why not we join the doctors? So we made an association of Indian doctors in Washington, D.C. And a senior most guy, we told him to become president and I became a secretary. But the whole genesis of RP began with the small Washington, D.C. chapter. Then when I got a chapter, I also found out that there are some chapters existing and some specialty chapters are existing all over the United States. So through embassy newspaper, this is early 80s. And I wrote to everybody and advertised that why not we all come under one umbrella and help motherland. That was the main thing. Second thing was to keep our culture. That time I had no idea of discrimination and all and, that. And then but, in a few years, you started getting letters from Indian American physicians because they knew uh, you were sort of the point person for RP. Talking about discrimination, because at that time, many of them had finished their internships and their residencies and were now trying to get into a practice. And you found that they were having problems with licensing, reciprocity, hospital privilege, etc. And that's how I believe the uphill struggle began about fighting discrimination and fighting for equality between international medical graduates and US medical graduates. Can you talk to that genesis and how it all happened and what an uphill struggle it was? Well, what happened initially uh, in API, uh, we had a senior, we call Uncle Kotari. Who was the first ever president first of uh, president. API. So yeah, I Dr. Ujamal Kotari. Ujamal yeah. Kotari. So I mentioned his name and proposed his name. He was a senior most guy, he was my, like my uncle. And so he proposed me as a vice president. People in jobs, jobs discrimination, people in reciprocity, even residency, promotions, hospital privileges, all this one by one people started coming to me. And I remember that it was overwhelming, but very few people gave in writing. So I said, unless you give me in writing, how do I address this issue? And it was new for me because I was doing well and I had no discrimination. I'm jumping now yeah. to 1985. I became president with all the, all the discrimination cases with me. So I said, okay, why not we join hands with others? So Philippines were number two. And then, in number of international physicians right. in the US, yeah. I think we were like 40,000 those days and they were like 30,000. Uh, when in 85, it was like 180,000 foreign doctors. We were making like 21% of the total medical force yeah. of United States, the total practicing physicians. And so the Pakistani physician came. At that time, what happened in Washington, D.C., uh, in Heights in Washington, D.C., across the Capitol Hill, we met and I invited everybody. So all the association together came and then I said, this is the complaints I've received and I think we should have a lobbyist. And that time we got Keefe and Company and Mr. Signer was our man for the one year. And, but we could not do much. I mean, he took me to many congressmen and uh, senators and senators others, yeah. and I, I sort of told them the stories. 
But remember, we were foreign doctors. We were known as foreign doctors. So many times they would say, why we should work for you? You are a foreign. So I said, no, sir, I'm, we are Americans, but we are branded as foreign doctors. Now what happened is, to jump a year ahead, I had a Con Smith as my patient. And I told Con Smith, I said, this is our problem. Do you have any solution? The next and why you told that to Kern Smith? Because he was a Washington-based lobbyist. Uh, yeah. Correct, correct, yes, correct. Yeah. And next week he brought Senator Hartke in my office. Yeah. And Senator Hartke was... And Senator Hartke was an Indiana senator who had just retired and also gone into lobbying and had a lot of connections with the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Congress. Right. He was a three-term senator. Yeah. And um, he has written a bill on the uh, kidney dialysis, yeah. I mean, uh, blood uh, hemodialysis yeah. for kidney failure. And it was... Uh, he was a very well-known yeah. uh, guy. Yeah. Now, now, rewinding a bit, you also have mentioned to me how uh, this whole let's not rock the boat mentality of uh, South Asian physicians, Indian American physicians, and even all the foreign medical graduates. You all were going up against the American Medical Association. And now you all were also going to play the aggressive game played by Americans when they want something done in terms of lobbies, legislation, etc. And I believe at the time there were also people calling you and saying, uh, what on earth are you doing? You are going to spoil it for all of us. Many of them started not show, not sending me the cases. I'm a urologist and referral was my base. And many privately openly said that you're doing for your own self or you're making a, a, just a show so that you prop up your own positions. But as this, what happened is that I have so many complaints and I did not know how to take care of that. At the same time, I was president of API and Mother India was there, but this became a bigger problem to me. And it was it was a personal issue now yeah. because you all were physicians practicing here in the U.S. Yeah. and here were all you foreign medical graduates being discriminated against Correct. and not being able to proceed even to practice in different states, hospital privileges and all kinds of things were yeah. happening. Well, there were bills in the Congress to stop the IMG training. Dole and Durenberg wrote the bills on that. And uh, so there, and AMA supported, the licensing body of the national licensing body supported. So we were in minority. And, 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 I, and, I, and I remember at the time it was pretty blatant. There were even advertisements where they would say foreign medicals don't have to apply for these residents. Oh, yes, sir. Well, not only residency, but also for jobs. In fact, I took this uh, in my testimony, this thing, CIA had the uh, Defense Department had uh, some advertisement in which it said, uh, we want doctors, but foreign doctors should not, because we were still called foreign medical graduates. And so coming to uh, Hartke now, now we started International Physician of American Physician Association, IAAP. And then this is uh, the first time I coined the word international medical graduates for our recognition and survival. Because foreign was being viewed as very derogatory. Yeah, and also they really thought we are foreign doctors, we are foreigners, but we were Americans. And now with Hartke, uh, Con Smith would take every Wednesday, I took off from my office, I went to congressmen, senators, and their staff and met them, and of course Con Smith arranged everything. Between me, Hartke, and Con Smith, one thing was common. I mean, one thing was decided also that talking will be done by Navin Shah, and they will not participate in any discussion. Fast forwarding, uh, you all met with uh, Congressman Stephen Solas, uh, who was like this lone savior of the Indian Americans and US-India relations at the time, because we are talking the Cold War years at the time. Yeah, yes. And there was also uh, on the Senate side, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, uh, former US ambassador to the United in Nations, Asia. former US ambassador to India, India. India. And also you had Senator Paul Simon, yeah. uh, who was then the junior senator from Illinois, and also knew a lot of Indian American physicians, etc. And you also had I, uh, Congressman Jim Bates. Bates. And amazingly, all four of them working together, uh, first a bill being introduced in the House, and then a bill in the Senate, and then finally in the Conference Committee. And also getting then the General Accounting Office, which was called the Investigative Arm of the US Congress, to introduce legislation calling for equality. You all got legislation approved and signed into law. How much of a victory was it? During the testimony, I said, uh, this is 
a comedy and a tragedy both. That 15 of our IMGs got Nobel Prize. We were treating patients little better than the American medical graduates. We had less discipline by the state boards. Licensing reciprocity was a big hurdle. In spite of all this, we had 20% in the medical faculty positions, that means teaching positions. So in spite of all that, discrimination was blatant. And um, so we thought that the Congress is the way, as you said, we played the ball the, the American way. And, uh, but we, we, we did not succeed because AMA was not only against us, but was lobbying against so also the state boards. Then eventually what happened is, we went to Congress, the Senate, we had multiple, we had 80 congressmen and senators with us. So it was not a small, of course, it was not only me, but I got support from all over India. I mean, all over America. Yeah, with a coalition of other like-minded. Right, and I traveled uh, all over America and I got, because we were paying like $80,000 to the lobbies, so we had yeah. to have some money. Yeah. Which in those days was like $800,000. Oh yeah, very yeah. much, very much. But what happened is, that GEO, I was a sole spokesperson for all the foreign doctors. And I have to tell you something about GEO and AMA, which is very important uh, in our struggle. So GEO came to my office every week. And eventually, AMA, HHS, AAMC, that is Medical Colleges of America, and the Federation of Licensing Board, they all came together. And I was testifying and I was a sole spokesperson so everybody attacked me mainly as is it was that yours you come from a low standard school and they were right in a sense because American schools were very highly developed in the curriculum and also teaching so I asked the gentleman who was repeatedly asking putting me down I said sir are you in practice and he would not answer. And that person was not in practice. And he was one of the bureaucrats. So I told them that whatever I studied in 1975 at Washington Hospital Center, in 1987, I'm not practicing because the medical science is evolving. evolving. At the same time, I'm keeping up with the CME. So judge me and not my medical school. And so that was written up in the GEO report. But GEO report did not use word discrimination. They said there is a different standard for foreign doctors, but that was good. Now, as far as AMA is concerned, I had about 40 complaints. So I took the file. After six months, I met with executive president, vice president, Dr. Simmons. And Mr. Nelson was chairman of the trustees who was with him. Now, they came one hour late, half an hour late, and the meeting was only for half an hour. And they said, you foreign doctors have to understand that there's nothing special. And um, you, you can go to the court, but we, AMA cannot do anything. By this time, we had 35,000 IMGs as AMA members. So I said, sir, I'm a member. But he said, I cannot do anything. I said, sir, you remember that I called the meeting and you are, I'm a member of AMA and you will listen to me. But all this was heard by Senator Hartke who was sitting in the corner. And of course... And now fast forwarding, here you are in a way, undeniably, your legacy has already been established. But you didn't relax. Uh, you took on philanthropic, charitable role with equipment donation schemes. You got back to the initial role of RP, which was to have a CME program and several other initiatives, working with prime ministers of India, uh, working with the uh, Indian embassy here and the government of India, I believe, also set up someone who to be a nodal point person for these charitable contributions and CME programs, etc. Uh, can you talk to some of the healthcare initiatives and how much of success you had? Well, in India, 40% deaths are due to infectious disease. So first I thought, let me start with the infectious disease. It took me seven years. I met every prime minister, every health minister, every health secretary, uh, till Narendra Modi. Uh, I met Narendra Modi. Now, what happened is that in India, general practitioner treat infectious disease or internal medicine. 
Now we have 50,000 internal, uh, I mean, uh, the infectious disease specialists in this country. India needs 150,000 because the great load of the infectious disease. So after meeting with all the presidents of MCI, Medical Council of India, eventually I think only Velour started. Now trauma, 365,000 deaths per year happens in India and there is no trauma system. So I said, we can start a trauma system with modification based on the American successful model. Uh, I took five surgeons from University of Maryland Trauma Center, Shock Trauma Unit, which is a number one in the country. It has almost 2% of mortality, which is very low mortality. I took them, government of Maharashtra, uh, took care of it. We trained about 100 surgeons, uh, government surgeons in Mumbai. And uh, we signed a, a, uh, MOUs, and MOUs all in, in, in which uh, the medical, uh, the trauma surgeons will come here and we will go there to train and sort of joint research. But the government changed and nothing happened. And the third is US-India Physician Exchange Program. So we are 75,000 practicing physicians in America. 15,000 are our children, like my son, who is the emergency room doctor at hospital center. They, I mean, they, those yeah. are Americans. Yeah. And 15,000 medical students in addition, 15,000 in the training right now. So it's a good number. It's a very large number. Say 10% or even 5% are interested. It will be seven, 8,000 doctors. And we have come from all different parts of India. So I started a web-based web program in which say you're a doctor, in, a urologist in Pune. I'm a urologist in Washington. You come at your own cost and stay with me. I come at my own cost and stay with you and develop whatever you want in India. My institution can help and there is a joint research we can do together. And uh, Government of India, Dr. Bachani uh, was, as you very rightly said, uh, was put uh, as a middleman, a, as an officer for uh, Government of India Health Ministry. And fortunately, the US India Business Council is supporting me, AM is supporting me. AP is supporting me, but the government bureaucracy, they don't want to spend uh, money on that because we should have one office in Delhi and one in Washington, which U.S. India Business Council has. The government did not want to send the money. I don't think Indian government has taken our willing advantage to improve medical education and medical health care, uh, I mean health care in India. And now we go at our own cost. Government doesn't have to do, but we have to maintain two offices. They don't want to take advantage of the first generation like me who are willing to serve the motherland. It's unfortunate. So what keeps you going when you find that you all are willing to walk the walk and then uh, they are willing to uh, talk the talk, but finally not walk the walk? Well, you know this, life has a limited years. And I come from India. They, they made me a doctor. Uh, and like me, not many, but a good number are ready to help India. It's a very unfortunate, but I'm an optimistic guy. Someday government will help. Someday some pharmaceutical company will help and we will be able to go with the expertise and we modify the expertise as suited to India. I know we don't have helicopters agreed, but we can modify and because we have already practiced in India. Uh, so hopefully one of these days my luck will open up and I'll serve my motherland. Uh, you also took on the medical establishment in a way and organized medicine in the US now in your later years uh, regarding a prostate screening examinations for senior citizens. There was a move to deny Medicare and uh, Medicare taking care of prostate, the PSA test that was given to senior citizens. How did that come about? U.S. Preventative Service Task Force came out in 2012. There is no need to do prostate cancer screening. Now, we have been doing screening for 20 years, and we have saved 50% of the mortality of prostate cancer. 
So it's not me. It's the, it's an American data. So I went with the American Urology Association and I said, sir, this is wrong. But they said, no, the our committee has taken the stance and we will not change it. So I wrote a paper showing that 70 years and older get more, the African-American get more prostate cancer and also people with the family history of prostate cancer. So after the paper was published, I went again to, uh, to the president of AUA, American Urology Association, and I was denied. So I went to Butterfield. Congressman Butterfield. Congressman Butterfield. Who was chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus in the right. Congress. Yeah. So he introduced a bill, and then I went to Senator Sessions, and he introduced a bill in, in Senate. And the bill said that we will re-examine the U.S. Task Force Service, uh, uh, Preventative Service uh, Task Force, and include the people, uh, men 70 years and older, and also screen. Now, I have written five papers and published six letters in the Journal of Urology, five published papers, and two letters on uh, Urology uh, Times. All supplemented with extensive research. Research of my own. And yet, I'm not being successful. Now what has happened is, is, is because 50% of doctors are not screening, so we are getting more cancer deaths, more metastatic spread of cancer. Once the prostate cancer has spread, there is no, no treatment. A death is certain. By the way, the PSA blood test which you mentioned takes only $25 per year. You know what's the cost of injection if you've got metastasis? $35,000. And we give four injections, which increases the lifespan for 3.8 months. Naveen, you surprised me a few years ago when I found that you have one of the best Indian coin collections uh, in America. Can you speak to how that became a hobby of yours and how you are now very much uh, interested in trying to show the culture and history of the Indian civilization through your coin collection? So I was collecting only paisas because that was, that's what I could afford. I had a good collection of one paisa. Uh, and then and slowly, slowly I collected ancient coins. So I came to America with all those coins with me because I loved it very much. And then of course I collected British coins and uh, Mughal coins and of course 10% of my coins are were fake also. But I used to keep them in the vault, in the bank vault. And eventually, what happened is, Mr. Hinduja had a British guy who died and gave all his collections to him to show it to the world. And Mr. Hinduja, Ashok Hinduja, a friend of mine, he showed me his collection. And that's where I found Manish Verma, expert on the Indian coins, who was working with Hinduja Foundation. So I asked Mr. Ashok Hinduja, can, can you send Mr. Verma for a week to Washington DC? And he did come. And um, he saw my coin collection and that's the first time I knew that I got such a good collection. Till that time I also did not know that I got such a collection. And he said it's a PhD material. Now my whole idea is to show it India is the first melting pot of the world. I would say we were, I don't know, we were so much guest-oriented people that guest was supposed to be the God, but all these people ruled us. And because many foreigners ruled us, we were very rich in coinage. India has the most variegated coinage than any, any part of the world. And we also have Roman coins because of business. But I want to show India's culture and history through the medium of coins. Thank you very much, Navin. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.